Manchester City and Inter threw up a nil-nil draw. I'm already bored of it, mate. What about you? Yeah, get rid of it. Mm. What's Rodri saying? He don't want to do it. <laughs> we'll get to that in a bit. The second of three nights. So we're going to have the kind of novelty of having the Champions League on a Thursday. To, um, you know, Obviously, we're recording this after the Man City game. So as we record now, tomorrow night, we're going to have Champions League on a Thursday, which is fairly interesting. But based on what we've just watched, wash yeah, out. Yeah, I did too many teams with nil tonight for my liking. To be fair, we had, we had an absolute glut of goals the night before. Yeah, that's fine. So they just need to spread them out a little bit more. A little evenly. bit more evenly. I think. I think Celtic um, uh, hogged a lot of the goals tonight. Maybe Sparta Prague did as well. I suppose Dortmund did. But well, that's about it, really. Um, very, very few and far between. And in the game we watched, Manchester City zero, Inter zero. Goose eggs. Luke Moore. It was a good yeah, it performance was. from Inter. But what did you think of the game was. generally? I thought it was a pretty tepid game, to be honest. Um, but I thought that that's exactly what Inter wanted, wasn't it? I mean, they set up in a way that you know made it difficult for Man City and said, "Look, come and break us down, then, and we're going to catch you on the break." And if you look at um, you know, how Inter would have approached it, it would have been, you know, we've got eight games. You know, some of them are going to be trickier than others, and this is probably the trickiest one on paper. Um, first time out, so let's just keep everything tight. I thought their shape was mm. amazing. They're so well yeah. drilled. Um, they did carry a bit of threat on the break because sometimes what happens, I think, is that if you're playing against Man City, particularly at their place, you can be well drilled and you can be in shape. But if you offer absolutely no threat, City just kind of realise that and the whole thing becomes really tough. And although I thought Inter lacked a bit of conviction when they attacked and that they perhaps didn't quite have the confidence they could properly hurt City, they did nonetheless carry a yeah. threat. Which which kind of gave a different dim- you know an extra dimension to the game, and so for that on that basis alone, I thought it was reasonably interesting. But you know, as you said actually on the WhatsApp to to us, you know, it needed an early goal really, it needed an early inter goal yeah. really to make it super interesting. And so many games in the Champions League like that, if you can get a goal for the team that perhaps isn't fancy, that the whole thing opens up. But we didn't see it, and so we had to be um, we had to be uh, content with. With a nil nil, um, but I actually thought Inter looked, you know, chiefly pretty comfortable. Mm. I I know that you know City racked up a number of shots, but they only had I think five on target the whole game. Um, someone made a couple of good saves, but he wasn't really asked to do a massive amount, and um, and 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 that's and that's how it finished. And I don't know how you felt. About yeah, no, it. I think you summed it up quite well there. I mean, I know Gundogan had a couple of headers, but when your focus is going to be on Haaland, and Gundogan, who, as you said, likes to always head the ball up. Um, it, oh yes, he always does that. <laughs> every every head is a defensive header. I don't I think when I don't he sees the ball that. in the air, he suddenly thinks he's a seal, and he says, "Oh, yeah, well, it could be yeah. that, Marcus. I think unlikely, if you don't mind me saying, but it could yeah, be yeah. that. I mean, we all suffer from it from time to time. I think. I, I think that that particular example, though, towards the end of the game, was you know he took it right off Harland as well, who you know possibly could have <laughs> notched up at what is a hundred his hundredth. Goal for Man City or something. What's the, what's the crazy stat? Well, he, it's like his had he have scored tonight, he, he would have become uh, the the fastest player in in Europe to score 100 goals for, for a European club. Cristiano Ronaldo, of course, right. is the current record holder. So, uh, Okay, yeah, right. Yeah. Well, I mean, it didn't happen and it's quite boring. Yeah, anyway. yeah. I, I mean, it, 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 this is the first time that Man City have started a Champions League campaign with a nil-nil draw. So thanks for, mm. for um, making sure it was the one we were doing a Ramble Reacts for, chaps. Um, yeah. But it, uh, look, Inter will, will feel, look, they'll, they'll feel pleased that they've got a point. The Etihad is probably the toughest place to go in world football, you would say. Oh, certainly, let's keep it in Europe, but you, you get the gist. It's one of, yeah. Yeah, out there with the Bernabeu, of. definitely. Forget about Fratton Park. Fratton yeah. Park, um, very, very tough. Um, the cottage. But- <laughs> <laughs> You're being silly now, aren't you? Uh, <laughs> they, but but they, they did have their chances. And Matteo Darmian, the the former Man United player, galloped through at one point on one of those breakaways where they looked very effective with with their breakaways, as you've already mentioned, and tried mm. to do a Gooty back heel. He thought, "Oh my God, I've been watching some YouTube clips. I'm going to get myself in in, in uh, I'm, I'm going to get my, my I'm going to make headlines with this rather than score, and I'm going to do a brilliant assist." And he got it all wrong. And you saw Inzaghi on the touchline going absolutely mad. And it is an absolute sick now. Because I always think that if a player has a shot and he misses, at least you know. Whereas with that, it was, yeah, you it was like, oh, how are you not shooting there? 
Yeah, he tried to do the Guti. Um, those of you who haven't seen that, that legendary Guti assist for Benzema uh, for Real Madrid, uh, I recommend you, uh, you you dig it out. It's a classic. Mm. Um, I think Darmian, you know, the two things that Darmian did in this game were that and he was on long throws. I think I know which one he's more suited to. <laughs> Look, he kept a lot of defensive discipline and shape. So, so we've yeah, got to give him his fair, props. He is quite, as, good, as like, he is quite good at And another throw. former Man United player, Henrik Mkhitaryan, came on and he had a chance as well. He did. There were, there were chances There were chances around him. Yeah. You know, I thought that City started... Mm-hmm. Start, the way I thought the game was going to go, City started to hit their yeah. straps a bit after about half an hour. Uh, a chance for De Bruyne, a chance for Haaland... Um, didn't really, you know, didn't come off, you know, didn't really come close to scoring them. But I thought, okay, they're gonna, they're gonna, um, they're gonna sort of kick on from here. They also got such options. I mean, they brought on Jeremy Doku, who kind of came was Phil ridiculous. Foden. When the, when the camera panned, the it was just like flipping. Nora. Yeah, there's over 400 international caps on the bench. Um, I thought Grealish looked quite yeah. bright. Um, he tried to make things happen. Um, you know, and and yet they they brought these as they brought more and more players on attacking, interesting, you know, threatening attacking players still didn't really have a chance to break down into. I thought I thought the tempo was a bit mm. slow, perhaps a bit kind of early season tempo maybe, um, but it was it was pretty easy for Inter. I also thought that um, Rodri looked like he was um, he was kind of finding his way back into the game, you know, getting himself up to speed after this break he's had. So, you know, it's not it's not the biggest deal in the world for City. I mean, they've got um, it's probably. They've only really got two more tough league stage games in this Champions League, away to Juve and away to PSG. This was the only other game on paper that could have been tricky for them, but I expected them to win it. I don't think it's going to make a massive amount of difference in how things go across this 36-team league. I think you know, City are still going to be there or thereabouts and do what they need mm-hmm. to do because um, they, they have some very winnable games in the, in, you know, in the near future in this competition, but it's not the start they wanted. And it will give perhaps a little bit of encouragement from from team for teams who think, OK, can we, can we get out of a Man City game with something? Um, there are teams that, that, that Man City are going to play who aren't anywhere near as good as Inter at doing it, but they'll see see what Inter did and maybe use that as the blueprint. And if City need to work harder and harder and harder to start breaking teams down, it's going to be tough yeah. for them. I don't expect that will transpire. I actually think they'll be fine. But um, it, you know, clearly they would have preferred to get off off the mark. Yeah, I mean, this is a good Inter side as well, we should say. Obviously they, um, Definitely played, really good. They were really yeah, good Yeah, played Man City in the final, what was it? two finals ago now uh, but I mean our, our, our very own Andy Brassel had Inter down as kind of dark horses which I think is fair I mean I, I think most teams are dark horses as long as you're not picking Manchester City Real Madrid Bayern oh, yeah. yeah despite Vincent Company being there but like that, maybe that's harsh on Vincent yeah but look how they started yeah exactly they yeah. did score nine goals so egg on my face uh, mm. and PSG I mean Vish chose PSG as dark horses I was like come on I know they've not that's got Mbappe ridiculous. but come on you know what yeah. you're doing there, but I, th- I think I think also I mean look I don't watch Serie A really much at all, so I don't know what Inter are like um, at the moment when they you know when they're attacking and when they're going forward. All I do know is based on what I saw tonight, they had a brilliant game plan. They were really well coached. You could see how well coached they were. The shape was yeah, fantastic. It's not ridiculous to say they're the they've best started, team in Serie A at the moment. They've started well. Yeah, they haven't lost a game yet um, in in Serie A. Yeah, you know, it's difficult to know. Well, they, they boast the, the best will... midfielder in the world. Um, according, well, yeah. Tell us, tell us a bit more well, about that. Well, according to the man himself, Hakan uh, Channel um he, he thinks he is the best midfielder in the world. Um, he was quoted as saying, fifth, Enzo Fernandez; fourth, Joshua Kimmich; third, Tony Cruz. Obviously, not playing anymore, but this was, um, uh, you know, not that long ago when he was playing. Second, Rodri; first, me. Why? Am I the best? Because I score goals. The others don't. If you look at the statistics, I never score from close range, but from 25 to 30 metres or from a free kick, those things are difficult. Yeah, I, I, I actually quite rate it. Do you? I quite rate it. So he says he that. can yeah, hit th- them. Th- um, and so that... Well, it's, why is John Joshi Elvin not getting a bench then? <laughs> if, you're going on, if you're going on who can hit them from distance, pal. John Ugly scored... Um... 15 goals in all competitions last season. Oh, I'm not denying he's a very good midfielder. I just for the time of it's player, just quite it's, it's, it's a bold decent. thing to say. Do you, do you think there's an element though? Um, I know they don't all say it because they're not all mad, but is it an element like a lot of players probably need to tell themselves things like that well, every week? Well, I'll, be, I'll be perfectly honest with you. I I haven't seen the footage of him saying this, so maybe it's a little bit tongue in cheek. However, 
the fact he gives a top five with some with some names that would be in there, obviously not Cruz now. You think, yeah, is that? Yeah, I'm not sure. But look, I. But we we all have to sit through before we start recording ramble episodes. You talking about how you're the best broadcaster in the world. Well, actually, I'm just reading quotes from other people. Um, so <laughs> you do your top you five. Know, who am I to argue yeah. um, with everybody else, yeah. Luke Moore? Quite frankly, Lovejoy, Lineker, you're doing all your top five, and then and then you do yourself at the top. <laughs> that's a that's a that's a different uh, group of people. Um, <laughs> well, look, so so yeah, I mean, look, the, the second best midfielder in the, in the world, according to uh, Old Hakan, uh, Rodri. Um, was asked uh, recently about the the new Champions League format and the scheduling and so on. And Alisson um, recently was asked this as well, the Liverpool goalkeeper, of course. And Rodri, um, much like Alisson, was saying, look, this is ridiculous. This is absolutely ridiculous. We've got two more games in the, the first round now of the Champions League. It goes on until January, the first round. It used to go on until December, of course. Then you've got, you're into the last 16, providing that you finish in the top eight. Otherwise, you could have a playoff to get into that yeah. two two legged playoff, the games are, are are coming as thick and fast as as ever before, um, and it was worked out uh, that it's conceivable that Manchester City all being well, and you wouldn't put it past them to go all the way in every competition. Uh, we've seen them do it. Could play up to eighty five games this season. Now last mm. season, Phil Foden for club and country. Okay, we're bringing in England and Euros, of course. Played seventy two matches. Which is, an, which is an insane amount of football. Julian um, Alvarez, um, Alvarez played 75. It, it is crazy. And, and, and Rodri said, you know, it, 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 between 40 and 50 is the amount of games which a player can perform at the highest level. And, and that mm. seems to be the thing. I mean, I remember when Pep Guardiola's Barcelona were playing phenomenal football and going deep in every competition. They, they, they look just absolutely invincible. And and I can remember thinking, blimey, those players are playing sixty games a season, mm. you know, with their countries as well. Because Spain were going deep into, it. and I thought that was crazy at the time. But as I say, there was mm. there was a handful of players, Foden and um, Alvarez, um, the, the the aforementioned ones, played over seventy. And Rodri said, um, you know, what about the possibility of players striking? He said, if it if it keeps this way, there will be a moment where we have no other option. Um, he said, it's just it's just absolutely ridiculous. So the talks talk of, of of players striking. I mean, I obviously that's just one player. You would imagine that um, he's speaking perhaps on behalf of a fair few players if he's going to say that a man of his standing in, in the game. But look, what do you think of this? Because this new Champions League format, people might say, oh, "Come on, it's only an extra couple of games." Well, okay, but you've got the Club World Cup coming as well, which is happening next summer, which Man City will be in. And I understand if you are a bigger team, you have a bigger squad, so you can rotate and. Uh, but you're still going to play a lot more games. What do you think of this issue that has been going on now? That we've been talking about it for a few years about players just being overplayed um, and the concerns that come with that. Yeah, well, it'll obviously be a tipping point. Um, we've talked about this a fair amount on the show over the last few months, and you know, there's to me there's there's kind of two potential ways forward. One will be players will strike. You know that, and you know that is not unprecedented for different reasons. Admittedly, um, in other sports, particularly in the US, um, if they can't get the deals they need, or they they feel like they want, or that they're worth, um, they there's you know seasons you know are are postponed or delayed or whatever for striking reasons among player unions in the US, um, or it will be that players will or they should anyway um, build clauses into their playing contract saying that they're only going to play X amount and then they say to the club you can you know you can have obviously a big say in the games I do play in but I'm only playing X amount and once I top out I'm not playing anymore and that's going to be in my contract players should really have quite a lot of the power here as long as they um, band together and do it in a unified way through FIFA Pro or, or whatever union you know is, is, is more local so so look it has, has to happen because really when we talk about the football establishment and authorities and the greed within them. We talk about Infantino or um, Seferin or, or whoever it may be, you know, you're trying to get more and more all the time because they think that, you know, football is so popular. It's such a cash cow. We need to, um, we need to kind of dine out as much as we can, make as much hay as possible because the sun seems to be shining forever. Clearly it's fans that bear a lot of the brunt of that financially, of course, whether it's TV packages or stadium, you know, tickets to the games or whatever, but um, 
but also it's the players, right? So there's limits on how much a, f- a human being can physically achieve. And um, what's going to happen is players are going to not play. They're going to say, oh, I'm injured or whatever, or they're not going to play to their full potential because they'll be so tired. And there'll be a breaking point, you know, and there's no way on earth the authorities, whether it's the Premier League or UEFA or FIFA or whoever, are going to are going to be out in front of this. They're not going to, they're not going to, they're not going to be in the vanguard of stopping this happening. I mean, it's going to have to be the players that do it. And um, I guess the only thing I would say is I'm, I'm not, um, I'm not taking it from a keeper. <laughs> <laughs> no, but joking aside, I, I think it's, it's the way it's going. You cannot do more and more and more all the time endlessly and not, um, and not, um, you know, expect there to be some, some kind of pushback. Um, I, I don't subscribe at all to this kind of outdated, antiquated idea that some journalists are saying in, in England about, Oh, would well, they get paid so much money? They should be able to do whatever they want. They're, hu- they're human beings, you know. They're, they're human beings. Um, there are limitations to what they can achieve physically and mentally, importantly as well. So, look, it's clearly going to run and run. It's going to have to come from the players because I don't think anyone in their right mind thinks that the um, the authorities are going to are going to do anything about it. So, I'm not surprised to hear. Do you it, think those honest. journalists? Or, and I know we won't even bother naming the papers who they are. Well, there's a guy at the Telegraph who seems to be a fucking moron. Well, it, it, don't you, name you just him, said a guy at the Telegraph, so we'll assume the um, the, the rest. Yeah, um, do do you think though that that's why? Possibly somebody like him thinks that like someone like Elon Musk is is like worthwhile and so on because the more money you have, the more kind of indestructible you are as a human being. Yeah. Following their the training, you have, the better so you if you're are. like a billionaire, yeah. you you must be like you're like an Avenger. You know, yeah. I think that's supposed to be the thinking. Right, yeah. that, that is it. The more money yeah. you have in your pocket, like go on, hit me. I've just I've just won the lottery. Hit like, me. It, just keep hitting me. <laughs> I'll be absolutely fine. It doesn't matter. If you do win, if you win the lottery, I will be fucking well. You. you know, well, um, I'll, I'll stop you by throwing it's, 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 it's notes at you. It's just, it's just an extension of um, when, say, you know, quite prominent footballers would openly talk about their mental health problems or depression or something, and the same old names as usual <laughs> suspects in the media would be like, "Well, you've got so much money. What have you got to be depressed about?" And it's like it's a fundamental misunderstanding of the actual yeah. issue, and. A lot of the time, they're writing about it for clicks or for to sell papers or whatever. But ultimately, it's damaging. It's fucking self defeating, and it completely misses the central issue that's being talked about. Um, and something will happen. It will have to happen. You can't. You can't reasonably expect, um, you know, someone to play anywhere near that level of of games at at the top level. The demands are just too high, not just physically, but mentally as well. And when we talk about that, we we sometimes talk about it in the way of like, oh, this is how many minutes mm-hmm. they've played. And 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 so, I remember recently there was a um, a graph that went up about Jude Bellingham. At some, I think it was a FIFA Pro event where they compared how many minutes he'd played um, compared to sort of I think Beckham at his age, Rooney at his age, yeah. Owen at his age. Yeah, and it was crazy. And and that was indicative, right? And that's quite revealing. But but actually, what's also forgotten about is because you and I and, and general football fans won't see this, you know, no one's talking about, like, the yeah. training, the travel. The travel is an uh, enormous thing. The, yeah, that you're always away from home. You're never on your own schedule. You're always hemmed in. I, I know plenty of people who are really high-achieving people doing really well on their own chosen field who would never want a life of a foot, top football yeah. player, which sounds counterintuitive because we so, we so idolise them. But you're not in control of your own life. Thanks for watching a clip from the Football Ramble podcast. Don't forget to subscribe so you never miss a video. And if you're feeling extra generous, why don't you like this video? Why don't you like this video?